State Prison, Folsom, California. Perched on a knoll a short distance from Sacramento, its grand design suggests a castle or medieval chateau. But behind these ornate walls is a 120-year legacy of executions, escape, and bloody violence. One of the years we had over 280 stabbings in the institution, over 400 rounds fired in one year. A normal day would be three or four or five getting stabbed. A bloody day is when you can look from the armory out to Larkin Hall here and see ambulances lined up all the way from the east gate through the entrance gate to Larkin Hall. That's a bloody day. Over time, Folsom has housed hundreds of grim characters like Jake the Human Tiger Oppenheimer, who murdered his way through the cell blocks. But Folsom's most notorious inmate was mass murderer Charles Manson. I saw through Charlie's game, so I suggested to Charlie that he never come within my arm's reach of the bars. I said, because Charlie, if I ever catch you, I'll pull you through. Prisoners once called Folsom the end of the world. Its punishments and living conditions were as hard as its gray granite walls. For many inmates, the last sound they ever heard of freedom was the wrought iron gate slamming shut behind them. Folsom was the second prison to be built in California. It was conceived in 1858 as the answer to the problems occurring at the state's first prison, San Quentin. After only six years in operation, that institution had become overcrowded and corrupt. The site chosen for the new prison offered a vast deposit of granite which could be quarried to construct solid, escape-proof cell blocks. The plans came from prominent Sacramento architect A. A. Bennett, who later designed the California State Capitol building. From the beginning, Folsom was envisioned as a place where prisoners would work for the benefit of the state. Hard physical labor was a part of the concept of punishment in vogue in 19th century America. It was believed that such work would both punish and regenerate criminals serving time. And so, in 1873, prisoners from San Quentin were brought to Folsom under guard and made to cut and quarry the rock to build the new prison. Thousands of tons of blue granite were cut from the quarry and within two years, the inmates had built the first cell block and support buildings. The structure had the appearance of a turreted castle from medieval times. This was intended to encourage a spiritually uplifting and transcendent religious transformation for those sentenced to do their time here. On July 26, 1880, Folsom recorded its first prisoners. Inmate number one was a Chinese immigrant convicted of assault with a deadly weapon. He came to Folsom along with 44 other Chinese prisoners. Most were soldiers in the Tong Wars, an ongoing conflict between Chinese organized crime rings that centered in nearby San Francisco. The population at Folsom eventually grew to include Caucasian and African American inmates. There were even a small number of women convicts who were housed separately in the warden's quarters. But the treatment of Chinese inmates at Folsom was typically the worst. Our first record showing Chinese inmates having a cell inside the institution would be 1913. Prior to that, they were in an unheated wooden building next to the mortuary. The general population at Folsom did not fare much better. Their stone cells had no toilets or running water. Now, in the old cell block, there, there was no ventilation in those old cells. There was buckets in there where you had to go in and a bucket to drink out of. And it was a stinkingest damned old place in the world to work, worse than a stable. The three-story cell block was built to hold 900 prisoners. The walls were built of granite blocks, each at least 18 inches thick. 
At the time, it was said that if a man was locked in one of these cells with all the tools, drills, and levers of a stone quarry, he would not be able to break out in 24 hours of uninterrupted labor. There was no electricity, and the inmates were issued two candles a month in order to read at night. The metal doors, cut from boilerplate steel, were locked each night by men called turnkeys. For the first 40 years of its operation, Folsom was one of the few prisons in the United States without an outer wall. Funds from the state had run out before it could be built. A line around the perimeter was guarded by six gun towers, manned around the clock by sharpshooters with rifles and gatling guns. Prior to the walls, they had a deadline. And if a convict went over that line, he was shot. And they knew that and they had visual deadlines everywhere. That's what kept them in prior to the walls. Prison uniforms were striped so that inmates could be easily spotted from the gun towers. The uniform also signified an inmate status as a prisoner. If a convict had all horizontal stripes, he was a bottom of the ladder inmate. He had no rights or no privileges uh, other than to get up and work 12 hours every day in the quarries or in the fields. If the inmate had vertical stripes on his pants and horizontal stripes on his shirt, he was a convict boss. He would supervise small groups of uh, 25 to 50 inmates at their tasks. And he had rights and he had privileges. At the top of the pecking order, honor prisoners wore striped pants with dress shirts, black vests, and black hats. At mealtime, these inmates ate the same food as the staff, including beef, chicken, and lamb. But the lowest prisoners sat at the bean table. They got their choice of beans from the top of the bucket or from the bottom. They ate from plates that were permanently nailed to the table. When they were done eating, the plates were cleaned on top of the tables. They'd throw large buckets of water on them, scrub them with the street broom, and throw another bucket of water on it, and that was the the, the sanitation for the day. By 1895, there were 900 inmates inside Folsom Prison, and more were on the way. The new state prison in Folsom, California, took pride in its innovations. These took shape under the leadership of the warden, Charles All, who was appointed in 1887. A former Wells Fargo detective, Ball was a strict disciplinarian and had a standing order for his guards to shoot any convict trying to escape. Ball also followed a mandate to improve living conditions. In 1890, construction began on a powerhouse at the prison that would generate electricity from the American River that ran below it. This was the first electric plant in the region. Eventually, the prison helped supply power to all the state government buildings in Sacramento, some 22 miles away. In 1893, the first electric lights were installed in the cell block, and inmates no longer had to use candles to read at night. It had taken 13 years, but Folsom finally had the basic amenities. Plumbing was actually installed about 1884. We put in flush toilets and and water, so things actually improved fairly rapidly, by and large. Uh, even the best conditions were never good. Everybody that was here was working in the quarries. The prison took few safety precautions. Accidents in the quarries were not unusual. The first victim was inmate number 117. His name was Peter Gibson. He had been convicted of larceny. He was crushed to death by a falling rock. Captain of the guard, P.J. Cochran, was standing under a derrick used to move heavy boulders when its boom fell off and killed him. Still, the quarry was profitable for the state. In September of 1882, the prison began to sell its granite to buyers all over California. Cemeteries throughout the region made their tombstones from the granite at Folsom. The stone base of California's state capital was also the product of the prison quarry. 
In order to move the heavy cargo into town for sale, the prison employed its own steam-powered locomotive in 1893. Because of the temptation for inmates to escape by stowing away on a train car, each outgoing shipment was carefully checked and an armed guard rode along. In 1893, inmates also finished construction of an ice plant that was powered by the new electric powerhouse. The prison manufactured three tons of ice per day and was among the only suppliers in Central California. Folsom also became a community center. As early as 1892, the prison hosted an annual 4th of July celebration. The inmates were treated to iced lemonade as they watched the prison yard fill up with visitors. On the 4th of July, people would come not only from all over the area, but from all over the state to visit the prison. Uh, we would have sporting events between the inmates, bicycle races, boxing matches, shows put on by the inmates where the costumes were provided by Hollywood. The convicts used to put on some of the doggone shows. Uh, they'd dress up in women's clothes and makeup. And there was one old fella used to eat razor blades and tacks and glass and stuff. The tradition of entertainment continued into the 20th century. In 1939, convicts and spectators in the main yard cheered as tennis champion Bobby Riggs played an exhibition match hosted by the prison. 34 years before he lost to Billie Jean King, Riggs won against the challenger Eddie Alou. Prison life also included a four-chair barber shop that was staffed by inmate barbers. Haircuts were standardized and convicts were expected to maintain a tidy appearance when they were seen by the public. But the complete view of life for inmates here was rarely witnessed by the outside world. Billy Burke was 18 years old when he was convicted of burglary in 1928. I would still rob a milk bottle. It started off that way and rob buses when the bus driver would get out to get something to eat while I'd jump in and get his cash box and any way that I could get some money. Burke spent 20 years inside Folsom's stone cell block. There were six of us in there at one time. And you'd be locked up at two in the afternoon and I mean, you just lay there and sweat and the bed bugs would jump off the ceiling to get at you. Uh, it was pretty hot and pretty miserable. The ventilation wasn't what they have today. So you lay there practically in the nude and for all them hours until six o'clock the next morning. The first recorded punishment at the prison was fierce and brutal. In 1884, four inmates who had started a fight in the quarry were subjected to hours of agonizing physical constriction in a cruel device known as the straitjacket. Unlike the shirt designed to restrain asylum inmates, Folsom's straitjacket was a canvas girdle made strictly for the purpose of torture. One inmate survivor who was stripped naked before his ordeal wrote, The straitjacket reached from my neck to my knees. The guard laced it up my back with a soft rope. I remember distinctly now that my fingers and hands were tingling, numb, dead, before he finished lacing me up. I got to a stage where I couldn't breathe. It seemed that knives were penetrating my lungs. It got to a certain pitch that I didn't think one could suffer so much. Some inmates were killed or deformed by the use of this and other grim punishments. For severe offenders, there was the torturous practice called tricing. There was uh, tricing rings where they'd uh, handcuff an individual and trice them, uh, pull them up to where they would be standing uh, and their arms in the air and just their feet would uh, still be on the ground but barely in, and they would stay there for the day for refusing to work. Use of these disciplines continued until 1913 when California's legislature labeled them cruel and unusual and abolished them. 
That same year, air holes were drilled into the solid steel cell doors that up until then had only small slots for ventilation and inspection. After 1913, only three forms of punishment were legal in California's prisons. The first was the removal of privileges like tobacco and outdoor recreation time. The next level of discipline restricted the convicts' meals solely to a diet of bread and water for an indefinite period. The most severe form of punishment was lockdown in solitary confinement for six months at a stretch. But while corporal punishment was not officially condoned at the state prison, it was far from over. Jack Pert's career as a guard at Folsom began in 1938 and lasted 26 years. He recalls his duty supervising a work gang. Once in a while, when I had a guy on my gang give me a little trouble, maybe he couldn't hoe very good, you know. Oh, mister, I don't know how to hoe. Well, I'd have an old con boss that was the toughest guy on my gang. I'd say, this fella don't know how to hoe. You know, and he'd say, hey, boss, look over there. Pow, he hit that guy on the eye. <laughs> and I'd say, do you know how to hoe, son? He'd say, I'm a hoeing son of a bitch, sir. <laughs> Violence and even murder were a fact of life at Folsom from its earliest days. To deal with the worst offenders, the prison stood ready to impose the ultimate punishment, the death penalty. In 1907, work began on the granite walls that now surround Folsom Prison. For 16 years, prisoners hand-cut and built the daunting 20-foot-high stone barrier that would enclose them. The true dimension of the wall is hidden from view. This is because fully one half of it plunges below the ground. The design made any hope of digging out as impossible as breaking through. To discourage climbing over the wall, the prison treated its inmates to a Saturday afternoon tradition known as testing the guns. We had water-cooled 30 caliber machine guns and we would put a short belt in them with 10 rounds and we would start off with tower number one, the armory, and we would shoot 10 shots into the hill. Tower two would shoot 10 shots and then tower three and tower four and tower five up to tower 26 so you would have about 30 or 35 minutes of continuous shooting. Everybody on the yard could not only hear all the shots, but you can look from the yard across at the hill on the opposite side of the river and actually see the bullets hitting. It, it had a very sobering effect. Still, there are places inside the stone prison that are unseen from the towers and by the guards on duty. In fact, there's, a, there's so many blind spots in this institution, and, and we try to correct as many as well as we can, but it's, it's just about impossible to. Just about everything goes on here. You have drug use, homosexual activities, you have killings, you have stabbings. Uh, you name it, it happens. Weapons like these makeshift knives, called gaffs, have been used routinely in the blind spots to settle personal differences and enforce a certain code among the inmates. Anybody that informed a rapo or an arsonist or baby molester, it wouldn't take them long to get them. They'd be waiting their time and catch them and, and, and kill them. Murder committed inside the prison was considered as serious an offense as it was on the outside. In 1895, Jacob Oppenheimer was sent to Folsom to serve a 50-year term for robbery. Within three years, he had killed a fellow inmate and was transferred to San Quentin to finish his 50 years and begin a life term for the murder. At San Quentin, Oppenheimer killed again, another fellow convict. This time, he was sentenced to death. He was transferred back to Folsom to await his execution. While on death row, inmates labeled Oppenheimer the human tiger because of his predatory behavior. He struck once more. The victim was another death row inmate. 
Finally, in July of 1913, Jake the Human Tiger Oppenheimer was hung by the neck, the prescribed manner of execution at Folsom. From the beginning, Folsom stood ready to carry out the state's mandated executions at the end of the hangman's rope. In December of 1895, Folsom executed its first prisoner. He was Chin Hao, convicted of first-degree murder. In all, there were 93 hangings at Folsom Prison from 1895 until 1937. Death Row was a group of stone dungeons isolated from the main facility. On the morning of an execution, the condemned man saw his last view of daylight through this window as he was led along the short walk to the gallows where the hangman waited. The last hangman at Folsom was a man named H.B. Trader. There was a cold-bloodedest man I ever met in my life. He would get ten dollars and the rest of the day off after he pulled a trap door to drop that guy. The hangman hung his rope from this area of the ceiling. This is one of his ropes and he would stretch it between a windlass and pull it tight, take all of the spring and bounce out of it. He would then weigh and measure the inmate that was going to be using the rope. And he would custom build the knot to fit the inmate's neck exactly so that it would snap his neck without snapping their head off. They had a problem with hangings was probably 30% of the time it acts to remove their heads when they would drop, they drop too far. The prison archive includes a logbook of the executions. Its chilling pages contain the faces of condemned men in their final hours. Next to that, a few brief words record the time of death and the distance dropped. Ivan Kovaler was the second prisoner hung in 1895. He was convicted of first degree murder and was dropped exactly seven feet. Edward Montijo was 19 years old when he was condemned for murder in 1925. He hung for 12 minutes before he was pronounced dead. 25 year old William Hudson wore the prison's white shirt and black suit to his execution in 1931. He was buried in a sheet so that the suit could be used again. In 1937, California installed the gas chamber at its prison in San Quentin. Thought to be a more modern and humane form of capital punishment, this step relieved Folsom of its execution duties. On December 12th of that year, convicted first degree murderer Charles McGuire was dropped six feet and one inch to his death. He was the last prisoner executed at Folsom. In 1916, Folsom Prison completed a monumental addition to its sprawling layout. This is housing unit number one, the largest single cell block anywhere in the nation. At the time it was built, it embodied the most advanced ideas in prison construction and took inmate laborers and stonecutters nearly two years to finish. The new cell block anticipated the arrival of 1,000 new inmates that would swell the prison's population to 2,500. Prison officials attributed this growth to a number of curious causes. In 1915, it was believed that an influx of criminals had come to California to visit the Panama Pacific Expo held in San Francisco that year. In 1920, with the creation of prohibition laws, a new class of criminal was born, the bootlegger. Alcohol offenses and violations of Congress's new drug act added to the alarming increase of prisoners brought to Folsom. The end of World War I saw another expansion in the prison's population. This was attributed to the homecoming soldiers who had returned to a poor economy and a lack of gainful employment. By 1930, the prison population was 2,097. 
More than half were locked up in the mammoth cell block known as Unit 1. Inside, 640 cells are stacked five stories high. The cell block is so large that its furthest reaches nearly disappear into a steel horizon. You have gunmen patrolling around the inside of the wall all of the time, watching the inmates in the cells and the movement in, within the building. But the cell block itself doesn't touch any outside portion of the, of the building. It's bigger than most prisons in the United States. Uh, this is just in one housing unit, which is run by a, a lieutenant, uh, two sergeants, and, and about eight officers. Because of its immensity and small guard staff, the dangers in Unit 1 are very real. Its blind spots allow for stabbings and assaults. But it is the open walkway or tier, more than five stories high, that inspired a macabre nickname the Superman training ground. Occasionally we get an individual that wants to play Superman or Batman, whatever they want to call themselves, and jump off the tiers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it's, it's a long way down. We've had two inmates uh, drop from the fifth tier. In each case, they hung over the rail like a, a kid at the playground by their knees and then just let go and they scream all the way to the floor, and that's generally the end of them. While suicide provided an escape for some, it is the history of breakouts that have earned Folsom Prison its bloody legacy. The earliest attempt occurred in 1893 at the Granite Quarry. Five convicts, led by train robber George Sontag, were armed with smuggled firearms that had been hidden among the rocks. Sontag and his accomplices opened fire on the guards posted above and tried to run. What followed was the murderous fire of Folsom's Gatling guns. When the smoke cleared, the entire group lay dead or wounded. The escape ended exactly where it had begun. September 19, 1937 marked another violent breakout attempt. Prison records call this day Bloody Sunday. It began as inmates lined up outside the officer's building, waiting to see guard captain William Ryan and the warden, Clarence Larkin. Armed with knives, ten convicts rushed into the inner office. They took warden Larkin hostage, captain Ryan hostage, and they then took them out in front of the captain's office. And the inmates ordered warden Larkin to order the guards to throw down the guns and the keys to the gate. Instead, the warden instructed his staff to stop the escape even at the cost of the hostages. And when Larkin gave the order, the guard stepped out in front of 30-06 and just started shooting inmates. Inmate Billy Burke was on the yard that Sunday morning. The first shot, if I remember right, come from a fellow down by the commissary gate. And he got one of the guys, and killed him right. And then the con started running their knives in the warden and Bill Rand. So but all of us guys on the line just turn around and vamoose back to the the yard. And then the, the towers all begin shooting and and these cons are just running around chasing anybody. The guards rushed in, they was it was a regular slaughterhouse there. Two inmates were instantly killed. Five dropped wounded, the rest were severely beaten with clubs. Warden Larkin died from a combination of knife wounds and strangulation. Captain Ryan was near death for a week, but lived. The five surviving inmates responsible for the warden's death were found guilty of murder. They became the first to be executed in the new gas chamber at San Quentin. The only successful breakouts involved cunning rather than violence. In 1930, Billy Burke himself escaped. He left a dummy on his bunk and hid in the prison morgue. When night fell, he made his break. I cut the screen, 
and it made a terrific racket and I, I was froze, you know. I, you're scared of everything when you're going through that. And I crawled out the window and I started crawling across the yard and, and crept by this guard tower and there was a dog there that belonged to one of the cons and he raised hell, but evidently the guard didn't think too much about it. So I got by that, went and I slid down a cliff and lit in the lower yard on some railroad tracks. And then I slipped into the canal. Burke made it all the way to Philadelphia where he was arrested for burglary and sent back to Folsom. In 1987, the prison saw its last successful escape. Glenn Stewart Godwin was serving 25 years to life for murder. He had a, uh, an accomplice who would come up the river in scuba type gear and got to an area that was somewhat of a blind spot where there was a lot of vegetation and very poor lighting. Uh, it was a major storm drain. Uh, he cut through that, uh, come up, uh, cut through a number of other gates and was able to uh, come up to an area where there's a manhole cover that's padlocked and was able to cut that padlock. Godwin got a work assignment that brought him close to the manhole cover. So then Godwin was able to just slip right back down the hole, go right out the storm drain, get in a life raft and disappear without being observed by anybody. By changing his appearance and using aliases, it is believed that Godwin has traveled through Mexico and on to Central America. Today he is still at large, his whereabouts unknown. In 1971, one of the most chilling mass murderers of the century was delivered to Folsom Prison. This was Charles Manson. Manson was the scraggly, wild-eyed leader of a band of young followers he called The Family. In 1969, Manson's incoherent preaching about race wars and Armageddon culminated in a savage murder spree in the hills above Los Angeles. Publicity in the Manson case was rampant, and his two-year trial ranked among the most expensive in California history. When Manson arrived at Folsom to begin a life sentence, prisoners and staff alike took notice. Father Dennis Keeney was the new prison chaplain. I remember meeting Charlie shortly after he came here, and I just said hello to him, and he came to the front of the cell, and he wanted to know if I knew who he was, and I, I knew who Charlie was, but I didn't want to give Charlie the satisfaction of being notorious in my mind, so I said, well, I really don't know who you are, uh, do you want to tell me who you are? I think he was trying to impress me or perhaps scare me. And he told me that he was so bad that if he could get out of the cell where he was housed, that he probably would kill me with his bare hands. Prison staff are instructed never to show fear in the face of an inmate's threat. I saw through Charlie's game, so I suggested to Charlie that he never come within my arms reach of the bars. I said, because Charlie, if I ever get you, I'll pull you through. And then I won't even tell you what I'm going to do with you when I get you outside here. Frail and weak at 37 years of age, Manson was held in Unit 4, the newest and most secure building at Folsom. Prison guard Tom Hickey was assigned here during Manson's stay. My first dealings with him, he tried to spit on me like they would do at San Quentin. He didn't realize that at Folsom I had the keys to his door. I just opened his door, hit him in the head, and told him, don't ever do that again. And after that, we got along fine. It was never a problem. In 1993, Folsom Prison was changed from maximum to medium security. Manson was transferred to Corcoran State Penitentiary to serve out the rest of his life sentence. The 1980s also brought a new wave of violence motivated by urban gangs. After 82, we started dealing with the street gangs, you know, the Crips and the 18th Street Gang and the different gangs coming in. These guys wanted to prove themselves so that they could get up and, and become members of the known prison gangs. So the violence just uh, kind of perpetuated itself. In 1984, more than 280 stabbings were recorded. 
Such conflicts were often settled by guards in the gun towers. If there were lethal weapons involved, if the inmate had a knife or a weight or was applying the boots to the other one's head, then you're justified then in using lethal force. So I would pick up many 14 and try to shoot him in an arm or a leg. All the ones I shot lived. Uh, I was lucky. I was able to maim them all instead of killing them. A lot of other people haven't been that lucky. The bloodiest race riot occurred on Father's Day, 1982, when a group called the Mexican Mafia confronted a rival gang, the Black Gorilla Family. Everybody pulled his knife. And for probably a matter of maybe, maybe two minutes, which sounded like an eternity, there was a real war there. I think they fired 22 shots that morning into that general area. And I was standing in the chapel door, and um, I just saw this Mexican inmate sitting on a rail, and then I just saw him just tumble off. He got shot right through the heart, and he just hit, hit the grass, and he quivered, and he was dead. Like many other prisons, Folsom continues to struggle to find ways to rehabilitate inmates. Well, there's no such a thing. The convicts will tell you that. They used to always tell me, Jack, when I'm tired of making you a job, I'll just quit stealing or I'll just quit messing up. That's definition of rehabilitation. No such a thing. Still, there has been much change at the prison. The mess hall, once an unsavory place where inmates were forced to eat a diet of beans from dirty plates, is now a modern cafeteria. Inmates are served meals planned by a dietitian and sit four to a table to minimize the potential for hostility. Still, most of the cell blocks are at least 100 years old and prisoners are expected to live as part of an ongoing process of retrofitting. Many await the chance to work in prison factories. The pay rates run up to as high as 55 to even some cases with bonus 80 cents an hour. Uh, we have a, a manufacturing plant up here where we manufacture all the license plates for the state of California and I believe since 1942 every license plate that's been made for any vehicle, car, truck, motorcycle, or whatever the case might be has been made right here at Folsom Prison. But not all the changes have been for the better. When the prison opened in 1880, each inmate cost the state $150 per year. By 1997, that cost was $30,000. When I came to work here, this was a self-sufficient prison. We spent less than $200 a year on things other than staff wages. We provided all of our own meat, poultry, vegetables, pork, lambs. We had canneries, we had an orchard, we had a dairy. We not only provided it for our prison, but we also sent it to the other prisons in the state. We've gone from being totally self-sufficient to totally taxpayer dependent. Through the years, one site has remained constant in the minds of inmates and staff, the prison cemetery. More than 1,100 men are believed to have died at the prison between 1874, when construction began, and 1957, when the prison employed a removal service to handle inmate bodies. Until then, not even the dead left Folsom Prison. If you wanted to carve your own tombstone, you had that option. We would give you the stone and chisel. If you knew you were going to die right away and you needed one, you could carve your own. Most of the men who were hanged at Folsom are buried here. So are those who died in the quarry or in riots. Inmates who suffocated in the jailer's straitjacket or who killed themselves are also here. In many instances, friends, if you died suddenly or by accident or during an escape, a friend would carve you a stone. And if you had no friends at all, you received just a wooden board with a number on it. And the majority of the graves at the cemetery are wooden boards with numbers on them. Today, 
120 years after it opened, Folsom Prison remains alive and well. By and large, its medium security inmates are cooperative and many await an early parole in exchange for good behavior. Despite Folsom's reputation for violence, the staff believes that most of the 2,500 inmates here want to do their time in peace. Troublemakers, they say, get a ticket to someplace worse.